Just getting started with SEO, search engine optimization, as an artist, maker, or handmade business owner, you're in the right place. In this video, I'm gonna share some SEO tips for beginners covering on-page factors, things like page titles, meta descriptions, headings, and how to optimize your images for search. Quick note. This video series was originally created as part of a beta version of the Badass Creatives Marketing Accelerator. I am moving all of my educational content from that program over here to YouTube so you can watch it for free, but the new version of the Badass Creatives Marketing Accelerator will still include a mentorship, support from me, and a community of other badass creatives, artists, makers, and creative business owners. So if you wanna learn more about the program and get on the wait list for when enrollment reopens, head over to badasscreatives.com. In this lesson, we're gonna be talking about on-page factors, and you might be wondering what those are. So on-page factors are the search engine optimization elements of your website and your pages that you have control over that you can edit and modify and optimize. This includes all of your website's content, everything from blog posts and product pages to informational pages like your FAQ. It also includes technical behind the scenes elements, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. So page titles and meta descriptions are one of these primary sort of hidden behind the scenes elements that are really important and if you can take the time to start optimizing these and just doing a little bit of work, it'll really pay off because a lot of people don't do this work. Um, and so what a page title and a meta description are, you can see here, this is a screenshot from Shopify, from a Shopify website for your selling beard oil. And so it gives you a preview of what this page title and meta description might look like in a search engine result page on Google or something. If you're looking you know, at a web page um, on, on that specific website, you're not going to see this on the front end. Um, if you're at the top of your browser tab, you might see a little bit of a part of the page title. Uh, that's often going to be what shows up in your browser tab, say you're in a Chrome browser or something like that. But generally where this comes into play is that when Google or another search engine puts one of your pages in the search results, if you've set a optimized page title and meta description, they'll usually pull what you've set for their search engine result page. So this is why it's showing this as a search engine listing preview. So the page title is what it says in blue, the best beard oil, natural, organic, and manly. And then you've got the URL underneath that. I'll talk a little bit more about URLs in a moment. And then the meta description is that little blurb in the black text underneath where it says the best beard oil on the market to grow and maintain, da, 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 right? And so basically, if we can optimize these two things, it's going to help us a lot. So let me share some more. Some best practices for your page title. So it's a title. It's what your page is all about. So you want to make it concise, short and sweet, easy to read, easy to understand very quickly. You wanna make it descriptive and relevant to that specific page. And since it needs to be relevant specific to that specific page, it also needs to have a unique page title. So you don't wanna use the same page title across all the pages of your website because every page of your website should be about something different, right? It should be for a different product or a different piece of information. You also wanna to try to entice people to click through. Think about if they're seeing this page title in the search engines, what would make them choose your page, your search result over a similar page or a similar search result? The meta description best practices are pretty similar. So your meta description, think of it as a little elevator pitch for that specific page. You're trying to summarize what that that one page is all about in just a sentence or so. You want to have a unique meta description for each page, very similar to the, the page title. You want to have a unique page title and a unique meta description, right? Because each page is different. And if possible, you want to choose a primary keyword or keyword phrase for each page and try to naturally weave that keyword phrase into your page title and meta description. Don't force it, um, try not to make it feel spammy, but if possible, try to work it into that little blurb of a meta description in a way that feels natural. Next, let's talk about URLs. Uh, your URL is what's highlighted here in green, right? It's your website slash, in this case, product slash beard oil. And so we also wanna make those URLs unique to each page and descriptive as well. 
because it helps the search engines and it also helps real people. So some best practices for your URL structure. You wanna add descriptive words in those URLs. Um, don't make it overly spammy, but just make it descriptive and relevant for each page. If you have blog posts, think in terms of evergreen URL. So something that will be able to be relevant to that page for potentially years to come. So we wanna to try to avoid including dates or years in our URL structure, especially for blog posts. And the reason why I suggest doing this is because you might have an evergreen blog post. Maybe it's a tutorial or something like that. Maybe it's a gift guide, but it's uh, you've written it in a way that it's specific to this year, but you could potentially update it two years from now and still have traffic coming to that post. If the URL has a year or a date or some other sort of specific information like that in that URL structure, it's going to make it trickier to update. Um, you could keep the URL structure. It's just kind of a hint that maybe this information is a little outdated and the URLs are trickier to update than just the content of a blog post. Now, luckily, most modern platforms that are built for e-commerce handle all the technical aspects of this URL stuff for you. Things like Shopify, um, Squarespace, they kind of handle all this stuff for you. So you don't have to get into too much of the complex technical elements of this. So I want to show you some examples. So this is some examples of what is recommended, what is good. So yourblog.com slash my awesome blog post. Camera store slash compact system cameras slash Sony slash NEX5 black 1855 lens. You can tell just by looking at that URL what should be for sale on that product page, right? It's a lens for a Sony camera um, and the whole store is selling cameras. Same thing with your awesome shirts website, right? We've got products and then we've got a black t-shirt with white collar. I can look at that URL and immediately see what that page is all about. Now let's see some not so great examples. So your blog slash 2016 slash 11 slash 23 slash my awesome blog post. This is what I was talking about when I was saying, if you have this awesome blog post and now it's 2022 right now as I'm recording this, this blog post might still be getting traffic, but if somebody sees that URL that says 2016, it's a dead giveaway that this content is kind of old, maybe they'll disregard it. And then looking at these products pages for the camera store and the awesome t-shirt, they're full of numbers. If I look at them or if the search engines look at them, we can't tell immediately what that page is all about. So that's the importance of having really clear, descriptive, simple keywords in your URLs. The next thing I wanna talk about is headings. When we think about headings for a website, if you think back to taking English class in high school or college, you might remember headings from doing research papers, English papers. It's basically the way that you would outline a page or a piece of information. And they also work for websites. It's headings one through six, which if you hop into a Google Doc or a Word document, you'll see a very similar heading structure. And it works really similarly on most websites. And the way it looks on the back end in the HTML, this is the screenshot that I have here. They're structured as the H1 um, and the H6. And a lot of times when websites originally get set up, like the themes are all set up and made to look pretty, some web developers, uh, they just sort of focus on the way that things look, but these headings actually do play a role in search engine optimization. Google and other search engines will look at the headings to help them understand which parts of the page are most important. And H1 is, number one, it's going to be the most important. And so you should only use that H1 once throughout the page, usually for your title, um, the, the title that people see on the website, which is a little different than what I was talking about with page titles, but very similar. Um, but, the, but the title that somebody actually sees when they go to that particular page or blog post on your website. And then you'll really mostly want to focus on H2 and H3 after that to kind of break up the information on the page. So let me show you kind of what this looks like. So this is a screenshot of just a tiny piece of a blog post on my own website. This is a post about tips for selling at a craft fair. And this is taken from somewhere in the middle of the blog post. So the heading of the whole blog post would have been something like tips for selling at a craft fair. That would have been in an H1 tag, but this number one, a great tent. So I kind of structured it like a list. I think it was like five 
craft show must have actually is the blog post, right? And so I had number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. But these are all equally important heading subsections of this blog post. And so this number one, a great tent and number two, whatever that thing was, those I would all mark with a heading to an H2. It's really helpful because if somebody is reading this pretty long blog post, it makes it easy for them to quickly scan and digest the information and understand, okay, now we're moving on to the next section. It also helps the search engine. So this is where headings are important. Just a recap of some heading best practices. Start with that H1 tag and only use it once per page. You really just want to use that for the title of your page, the forward facing title that people see. You want to use headers to provide organization and to break up text, especially if you've got long chunks of text, headings can be really helpful for that. And you also want to add keywords to your headers, but don't do it in a way that feels spammy. Don't keyword stuff. Try to use it in a way that feels natural to help break up and organize the information on that page. Next, let's talk about image optimization. Best practices for images throughout your website. You want to use relevant, accurate alt text. And what alt text is, if you've ever been on a website and you kind of hover your mouse over an image and sometimes a little extra block of text will kind of pop up next to your mouse, that's the alt text or alternative text. Alt text is really helpful for both search engines. It also helps with accessibility for people who may uh, be visually impaired or blind, and they might be using screen readers to help to describe to them what the pictures are on the page. You also want to consider using captions. Again, captions are helpful for accessibility and people who may be quickly scanning the information on the page. It's also really helpful for the search engines. Search engines are not smart enough always to see exactly the way that we as most seeing humans can see things. So we just have to help them by describing what's in an image. We also want to compress images for faster load time. So before uploading images to your website, make sure that you're resizing them to be only as big as they really need to be for that website. You don't necessarily need the same uh, file size and high quality image for your website that you need if you were going to run a full page print ad in a magazine. And then lastly, we also want to rename our image files to be descriptive before we upload them to our website. This also helps the search engines. So a little bit more about all of that. So alt text or alternative text. This is an example of what it might look like on the back end of a website where you're editing this. Um, most website editors, whether you know Shopify, WordPress, Squarespace, whatever it is, most of them are going to have some option for you to edit this. They all function a little bit differently. But basically, just like it says here, you want to write a brief description of the image to help improve search engine optimization and to help with accessibility for people with visual impairment. And so in this picture, it's, it's a cup of hot tea. And so they've added the alt text of hot tea, uh, hot cup of tea zone hibiscus fusion herbal tea. They've just described exactly what it is. And then image compression. Most uh, image editing software has some sort of save for web feature. So I encourage you to use that, right? If you need to crop a photo before you upload it to your website, when you're doing all of that, when you're finally saving the whole thing before you upload it, use the save for web feature, right? That'll make it take up less size when you finally upload it to your website. There's also extra uh, services you can use. I use one called Image Optim from Mac. That's what the uh, Fishbone Alley, this black screenshot is. You just drag the photo or you know whatever the file is into the thing and it smushes it all down for you, basically. It just compresses all of the data in the file. Um, there's also one called Tiny PNG that is browser-based on the web that is free to use. Uh, that's the screenshot with the little panda bear there. Okay, so here is a picture. So I'm gonna show you what a good file name and what maybe a not so good file name for this picture might be. So what do we got? So we got some really adorable little pigs. They are wearing silly birthday hats. They are hanging out in the mud. Okay, so if we had this picture and we wanted to upload it to our website, an example of a good file name would be pigs wearing birthday hats, Ryan McGuire gratisography. So Ryan McGuire is the photographer, Gratisography is his company name. So we put kind of a brief description of what is actually in the image first. And then we also added the name of the person who took the photo or who the photo belongs to, right? So you might want to add your company name if it's one of your own products. 
Um, but I would say like add a description of what the actual image is of first and then add your company name at the end of the file name if you want to do that. This would be an example of a bad file name. This is like what would just come off of your camera or your phone or whatever you're taking your photo with, right? DSC underscore zero one, two, three, four. This is not descriptive. Um, if, if you see it, you're browsing around on your, in your files or on your computer and you don't have a preview to actually see what it is, you would have no idea what this file was until you opened it. Same thing with a computer, same thing with a search engine. They have no idea what this photo is. So by adding that descriptive file name, it helps them see what it is. And that kind of stuff using the alt text and adding these descriptive file names will help you get found in things like Google image search, which is one of the biggest search engines on the web now.